preaching and, and uh, uh, Dave uh, leading the singing one week for us, uh, giving of his time to come over and help us. And uh, appreciate it. Glad you're back. Missed you, that's for sure. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Psalm chapter 25. Psalm chapter 25. TJ, I know you're up there, but he might need to turn me down just a little bit when you get a chance, okay? Thanksgiving is coming. In fact, next Sunday night, we have our harvest dinner. We'll talk about that more when service is over this morning at the end of the message and the announcements. But if you think about Thanksgiving, it's a time of praise. It's a time of giving thanks to the Lord. Um, I don't know about you, but I enjoy uh, just the whole Thanksgiving time of especially that day when we sit around the table and we, before we eat, we, we give uh, a praise to something we're thankful for. That's something we're going to do next Sunday night at our harvest dinner is giving thanks and giving praise for our life. And it's during those times of Thanksgiving, Christmas, this holiday season, when you think about the presence of God that um, we have find ourselves thinking, gee, I just wish I could stay in this situation all the time. I wish I could just stay in this continual sense of praise and this continual sense of feeling the presence of God in my life. And uh, it's like here at church, we come and we sing and we worship and we praise God and we say, boy, I wish I could feel this way on Wednesday morning. I wish I could feel this, feel this way on Thursday. Uh, when it gets to Friday, it's been a rough week, but Thank goodness Sunday's coming, and, and we, we, we enjoy the time of fellowship, and we enjoy the time of singing. It's going to be what, like it's, like it's going to be in heaven. When we get to heaven, it's just going to be continual praise, um, continual uh, with the Lord. Well, in Psalm chapter 20, and I want to talk about that this morning, uh, living in God's presence continually. How do, how do we do that? How can we, as a believer, live in God's presence continually? Well, Take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 25. I'm going to put the words on the, the words on the screen, but I want you to turn in your Bible and turn there because I want you to underline a, a, a specific <clears throat> phrase. The Bible says, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. The phrase I want to focus on and focus our attention on this morning from this verse is the, really the last part of this verse for you, I wait all the day long. If you, if you have your Bibles, that's kind of hard if you're using your iPad, unless you have one of those really good modern ones where you can take a pen and underline it on the screen. But um, underline, underline the words there in your Bible. For you, I wait all the day long. This phrase I want to focus on this morning bring our attention to this last phrase is what I'm thinking about is the fact that these words describe something very, very different than calling upon God in the day of trouble. Waiting upon the Lord all day long is different than, than, than calling upon God early in the morning when you rise up and before you your feet even touch the floor, you say, God bless this day and be with me, or you spend a little bit of time in prayer, or even on your drive, wherever you're going to work or wherever in the morning, you spend some time with the Lord. It's even more than just going out on the back patio in your, in your yard and saying, okay, I'm going to spend some time with the Lord this morning. This, this phrase even is more than just meditating upon his laws. The Bible says in the night where we meditate upon the things of the Lord. And the difference is this, that these words, for you I wait all the day, don't describe any, any particular time at all. They're not limited to one to one moment of the day of the, or the week or even a situation. In other words, this phrase doesn't describe what we might typically call somebody's individual devotional life. Now, having a devotional life is good, and having a devotional life is very important. I'm not saying it's not, but these words from our text describe something much deeper something that must follow up on the devotional life, having our devotion, if, if, if it's to have any meaning at all, if it's to carry with us throughout the day, if it's going to have any pulling power in our life as a believer, our devotions, then this phrase takes us even beyond that. In fact, I would contend today that in these words, for you I wait all the day, in those words we have the reason 
for the most common complaint about having a devotional life and having your devotions. Because the most specific and repeated com uh, complaint given by even sincere, honest Christians is that they sometimes find their devotions dry and boring. As much as they wish it didn't, they find them dry and boring, that they don't get that much out of the Bible reading. They don't get that much time much out of their prayer life. It's something like, I got to do and get it done with. So this verse, in fact, the last phrase of it, really can help make our study of the Word, it can make our prayer time with the Lord, and it can make our Christian life in general more vital, more impacting, on the very way we think and the very way that we go on throughout our day, this verse can be a great help in your faith and help make your, feel, your faith feel more genuine and more real and more complete. For you, I wait all the day long. Now, the first point to the message is what I'm going to give you here, and, all the, and it's really the main point and the only point, and all the other points kind of just really explain and amplify it. But, if, but for any serious Christian, we, we need to put this down. Knowing God requires more than visiting God. I hope you write that down. Knowing God requires more than just visiting God. And that's what stands out and shines so clearly in this phrase, on you I wait all the day long. Philip Yancey, in his book, he writes of the experience of the Christian columnist Malcolm Muggeridge in the early 1970s. Muggeridge was stunned to learn that members of the Soviet intellectual elite were experiencing a renewed interest in spiritual issues. And Muggeridge met with a Russian dissident living in exile in England at that time, and he told Muggeridge of the revival of the Soviet Union. Muggeridge writes, and he said, I asked him how this could happen given the enormous anti-religious brainwashing job done on the citizenry and the absence of all Christian literature, including the scriptures. And this man's response was this. His response was, was memorable. He said, the authorities, he said, forgot to suppress the works of Tolstoy, one of the most perfect expositions of the Christian faith for modern times. I want you to listen to what Leo Tolstoy said about the kingdom of God within you throughout the day. And, and as, you, as you listen, I want you to keep this phrase, on you I wait all the day. I want you to keep that glue to the front of your mind in regards to this, okay? Tolstoy wrote, he said, a man who professes an external religious law is like someone standing in the light of a lantern fixed to a post. There is light all around him, but there is nowhere further for him to walk. Get the picture? Light post on the street corner. I was going to go to Walmart. I found a great one. There was a Christmas one with the light post, and I was going to get it and bring it and have it sitting right here. But somebody would have thought, what a dumb, what a dumb Christmas decoration that is. Okay, so I didn't go get it. But you know what a light post is. Stand on the street corner. He said this. This is a person who, who, who professes the outward Christianity is like standing here. The light of that light post just goes around it. But beyond that light, there's nothing else. He goes on to write, a man who possesses the teaching of Christ in the heart is like a man carrying a lantern on a long pole before him, always lighting up fresh ground and always encouraging him to walk further. Let me read that again. A man who professes an external religious law is like someone standing in the light of a fixed light post where that light is only right around it. But a person who really possesses Christ in his heart is like one carrying a lantern on a post, and wherever he goes, there's light. Now, folks, religion, even Christian religion, is not the same as walking in the Spirit. Because there is there's a lot that people can profess with little or nothing of the presence of God in their life at all. So Tolstoy's picture comparison of these two these two lamps is, is really brilliant. One is portable and one is not. 
And in that picture, Tolstoy is describing two kinds of religious experience. One of them doesn't go anywhere. It has a fixed reference point of commands and regulations and prayers. The other is totally taken up into the life that's possessing it. It's totally taking up into the life of Jesus Christ. It carries the dynamic of the kingdom along wherever it goes into everything it touches all the day long. I keep it before me. That's this phrase. So keep that in front of you th this morning, that in all the day I'm with you, all the day long. It's like this. It's like being married. And you get up in the morning. Should be sitting over there. Better illustration. You get up in the morning, and I say, good morning, honey. Get out of bed. I love you. I love you, Steve. Give a hug. I love you. Go on about my day. Da, 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 da. Different things happen throughout the day. I get back home. Hey, good morning, honey. I uh, good evening, honey. I love you. She says, I'm glad you remember what time of the day it is. Uh, yeah, good morning. But during the time I said, good morning, I love you in the morning, I let other things captivate my mind. That pretty woman at the water faucet. The lady at the counter. I get back home. Hi, honey. Good. I love you. The idea here is that what I say to my wife and what you say to your wife in the morning when you first get out of bed is something that you carry with you throughout the day. Get the picture? Rather than just saying it and then saying it again at night, you carry that relationship with you throughout the day. And this is what this is what the psalmist is saying here all the day long. And this, this idea of this light, carrying this light with us, is that in everything I do, everything I go, that relationship with Jesus touches my life all the day long. Now, the important question has to be, what makes the difference between these two experiences? What's the difference between some static, some stale life and transforming life? religious profession that I make? Well, to find a verse that could answer that question would be profound, which, which would be great, which would be life-changing experience. And the psalmist in our text tells us the difference, it, and it has to do with the understanding and the maintaining this very vital thing between the ingredients that nourish the Christian faith, which is our devotions, and the actual living of that faith moment by moment in our life. Let me try to make it a little bit clearer. Because if my waiting on God is something I do and then leave, it's not going to have any lasting value in my life. In other words, I just get up, have my devotions, read my Bible and pray, and it has no lasting value. It's, if I just come to church on Sunday morning, I'm here, but I don't carry it with me what I what I feel in my heart throughout the day, throughout the week, then what you get here is not going to have a lasting impact. Agree with that? If my waiting on God is just a passing visit, even if it's a long, passionate visit, it won't have a life-changing power in its life. In other words, I, I, I come to church, I passionately sing, I passionately pray, I passionately do what God wants me to do. I, I, I take notes. I go home. I, I, I'm, I'm all in on what's happening. But it's just something that I, 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 I do, and it's just a passing thing. Even though it's passionate, it's not going to have the long-lasting effect in my life that God wants it to be. If I merely call on the Lord but then do not live with the Lord, then my cry is going to be empty. And because the spiritual troubles of many people are rooted in this very broken and fragmented idea of the devotional life. In other words, they've allowed their devotional life, they have allowed their Bible reading, they allow, they have allowed their prayer time, they have allowed their time with the Lord to be simply become something that's a routine. It's just routine. I'm going, I'm into it. And, and in fact, Pastor Steve, I'm, I'm passionately in, into it. But it's just something I do. And then I move on from it. I leave it. 
The practice of devotions comes to be something like the repetition of a drill, a spiritual drill. And, and the problem is, is that many times us pastors have added to the problem because we have referred to our devotions as a form of spiritual exercise or some disciplines that we need to do. And they have their place and they are important and we should do them as long as it's properly understood. There is value in the exercise. There is value in having your devotions. There is value in having your Bible reading. There is value in having your prayer time. There is value in the disciplines of the spiritual drill of devotions. But at the end, or the goal of the exercise is to merely feed us or to teach us that our devotions are going to be empty if we don't carry that with us throughout the day. I told... I told uh, our men, I said, you know, Howard Hendricks, former professor at Dallas Theological Cemetery, cemetery, seminary said, <clears throat> cemetery, seminary said that when you teach or preach, you should always do for life change. You you should ask, what do I want them to know from the text? What do I want them to do? feel from what they know? And then what do you want them to do? You don't just stop with what do, you want, what do I want them to know and what do you want them to feel. It should always carry into action, into what we do in our life. And I would say to all of us the same thing, is that when we have our devotions, when we read our Bible, we should read it with the idea of what does the text say what is it I should feel from what the text says that I'm reading about God's Word? Now, what is it God wants me to do as a result of what I read? What is it I carry with me in my life? Because, folks, listen, if, if, we, if we feel that Christian growth and living for Jesus and being strong is all wrapped up simply in a a, a devotional exercise or spiritual discipline that we're doing, then we're going to raise a generation of Christians who think that the Christian life is, is contained in just those times of, of special events, that the Christian life is contained in, in coming to church. It's contained in our prayer time. It's contained in our Bible study. And, and we leave it all detached from the habit of actually waiting upon God all day long. The last thing I want my church family, I want you to do is, is come here on a Sunday morning and then leave it here. Walk out this door, go home, and leave it all here. Oh, I did it. I came to church. Had my Bible reading. I, I did it. I leave it there. And then we go on throughout the day. No more than a husband and wife says to their wife in the morning, honey, I love you. And she says, and then go about your day with your mind on someplace else. Oh, and then I'll come back later. And so it's the same thing with the Lord. He, what, what we say and what we do in our, devo in our devotions and our Bible reading is not to be detached from how we live. Okay? Well, the second thing I want you to get is this. Approaching God is never something we can do and then be done with, which feeds on what we just said. That's why I said the first point is the main point. These all add to it. Approaching God is never something you can do and be done with. I've not really entered the presence of the Lord if I can simply leave it behind. Genuine spirituality is, is, is marked by the way in which it waits on God all the day. And the psalmist is very careful to explain his meaning of this wonderful phrase right here with the, with the, the verses that, are, that surround it. Look again at, at verse 4. Chapter 25, verse 4, make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Then he says, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Look very carefully at those words. He says, make me to know your ways. Teach me your paths. And then he says, lead me in your truth. Lead me in your truth. There's a vital difference, folks, between learning truth and being led in truth. 
That's why the psalmist talks about knowing God's ways and knowing the paths of God. Because you can't learn a path like you learn math. To learn a path, you must walk the path. To learn a path, you must be led. And that is why David doesn't say, the Lord is my professor. He says, the Lord is my what? My shepherd. And here's why some people find the Christian experience very frustrating. Here's why Christians flop around from highs to lows in their Christian walk. All depending upon what the last service was that they went to or maybe what message they just listened to or what song they just heard. Nothing in the Christian life will work when the feeding is divorced from the living. I must carry it with me all day long. We, we call upon God, yes. We go to church, yes. We read his, his word faith, faith, faithfully, yes. And you would challenge anyone who questions you about your faith. But like many of us, we come and go, we're up. And anybody ever feel like you're, on a, you're like on, a, on a roller coaster spiritually? Come on, be honest. You're just up and down. Man, I tell you what, it's just like sometimes the Christian life for me is I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm hot, and I'm cold, I'm up and down, I'm on a roller coaster. It's hard to stay consistent in my walk. I'm in and out. One week I'm hot for God, I want to live for Him all based upon the service we just experienced, and then all of a sudden we get cold. We come and go. We approach him, and then we go our own way. But here's the warning, and also the invitation of the psalmist, you, that you will never be able to make the Christian life work that way. It was the way it was intended to work unless we come to a place where we take the, the last phrase of this verse and we say, upon you, Lord, I wait all the day long. Next point, learn to wait on God all the day. You say, Pastor, I can't do that. I go to work. If students are in here, they say, I go to school. I mean, I'm not, I can't be a monk and a missionary. I can't be a monk in a monastery. No, we're not monks. We're busy people with busy schedules. I mean, a lot of times, even retired, any of you got more busier the more retired you got? You say, I, I'm retired, and I'm going to have some free time, and all of a sudden, you, you found yourself, man, I'm more busy than I was when I was, than I, when I was working. Okay, good. Our schedules get full. So we look at it, and we say, wait a minute, Steve, wait upon God all day long? I have a busy schedule. I'm not talking about something you put into your schedule. Let me give you three ways of how we can wait upon God all day long. Because again, the last part of this phrase is the key to faithfully, consistently living your Christian life. It's making your devotions and your prayer time more exciting, more vital. It's making your Christian experience more vital when you carry that all day long. Again, I use the marriage situation over and over illustration. Your marriage will be more vital and more real when you carry the love of your wife and your husband throughout the day with you. Can I get an amen? Okay? It's not just something you say and leave it home when you get in your car. And then you pick it back up again when you get home. But rather you carry that love for your spouse, for your family, with you all day long, and it makes your marriage so much richer and, and more real. And what the psalmist is saying here, if you want a vital Christian life, if you want your devotions to be alive, and your prayer life to be alive, and your worship to be alive, and Sunday morning to be alive, and, and you just want to be in, a, alive with Jesus, then, it, then you carry this with you all through the day. So let me give you three ways to do this. Three ways to wait upon God in a very in the midst of a very busy schedule or non-busy schedule. Number one, recall to your mind the presence and the words of Jesus with frequency. In other words, don't let them slip into the subconscious part of your mind. 
carry those thoughts, carry the word with you throughout the day, the presence of Jesus with you throughout the day. John chapter 15, verse 4 through 7. Don't need to turn there, but just write it down if you would in a reference. John 15, 47, it says this, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done by you. There is, there is no detached spiritual life. It is not something you can live on your own for, for one minute. Jesus says, part of the, of the abiding in him, please get this, the part of the abiding in him is the waiting on God all day. In other words, it's keeping his words in us. That's what it means to abide. Abiding in him. I'm keeping his words in me. He is outlining here in this passage in John the crucial distinction between reading his words and recalling his words, abiding in his words, and his words abiding in us. Abiding in Jesus simply means being programmed by his words. And so as you start your day, I challenge you with this. As you start your day, take some principle that you've seen in his word. Put the principle of the passage into a sentence. And then restate that principle over and over during the day. Keep the power of the principle of God living in the word. That's what this means. Recall to your mind the presence and the words of Jesus with frequency. Second, remember to whom you belong all day long. It's like getting started right in the morning. There are certain things you do that get you going. How many of you, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you need is what? Coffee. If you don't get your coffee, what happens? <laughs> Fall back asleep. Some people have a rough time just getting going until they get their cup of coffee. And sometimes people, it's not just one cup of coffee, it's several. Robert's got his coffee just to stay awake in church. <laughs> Remember to whom you belong all day long. That's right. That's why when we get up in the morning, like just some people need this to get them going. You get up in the morning, you remember, I belong to Jesus. What keeps, what, how do I, how do I carry with me all day long God? Number one, I'm going to continually let the words of Christ come forward in my mind. Maybe it's out on the workbench, it's in the workshop, it's in your car, it's a, make sure you're not, you're driving, okay? Um, but, but put something over that just all, is constantly before you where you constantly see principle from God's Word, keeping the thoughts in your mind throughout the day. It has nothing to do with your schedule. And when I'm out there playing golf, and I'm having a very, very, very bad day, which normally is every time I play, it's just, you know, mm, letting the mind of Christ be in you. You know, as you walk along the golf course, you're just you're quoting a verse that you just learned that morning, or a principle. Maybe it's not the whole verse, but it's a principle from that verse. And as you're playing golf, and as you tee off, and as you're putting, and as you're playing, or as you're fishing, you're going out on, on the ocean, and whatever you're doing, all of a sudden, there's, you're, you're allowing the thoughts of Christ and his word to come back to you throughout the day. It has nothing to do with you fishing, or working, or your schedule, or your appointments, or anything like that. You're just reminding yourself in your thoughts the principles of Scripture, of the Lord. And when you start off in the day, you remember, Jesus, I belong to you. I'm yours. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, a foundational principle that needs to be tattooed to our heart is this, Oh, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have, you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Just simply reminding who I belong to. I belong to him. 
Watch, the words of Christ will, get, will go a lot further with you. There'll be a, a deeper meaning. If you remember, they come from the one to whom you belong. So again, keeping in your mind, going back to those, that point, recall to your mind the presence of the words of Jesus frequently will have a greater effect when you remember who you belong to. If you feel that you are your own boss, you're the captain of your own soul, your words aren't going to last long. But, but if, you, if you realize that your thoughts are constantly coming from God, then they're going to have a far greater effect. But if you see yourself as your own boss, then your own thoughts are, gonna, are going to continually override God's word. And your devotions will be even worse. Here's third, the third way. Do not allow into your mind things that will rob precious truth. And I just put that on the screen as a shorter version of it. Really, do not, do not allow into your mind the things that will things that will smuggle in satanic deception and rob precious truth of its intended power. Do not allow into your mind things that will rob precious truth. Increase the security over your mind. That's what the psalmist is saying. Your mind is more important than any border crossing. Your mind is more important than any airport terminal. And we just went through on this vacation, we did a multi-city trip. And can I give you, don't ever do that. Okay? Round trip is one thing. Flying from Medford to L.A. and going through security at Medford, checking in luggage and then going through security. We get to L.A., see Sadie, and then we have to fly out of Orange County. We have to check in luggage and go through security. We get to Atlanta, we rent the car, and then to come back home, we go through Atlanta security and fly back. So we go through security three times. And so we were talking about all the stuff that you, all, basically, you got to take off all your clothes. You know, I mean, you just like, take off your shoes, take off your belt, take off everything in your pockets, you just go through, and then you stand there, you know, you go through all of that, and then they say, oh, sir, please come step aside, and then they go through all of your, all of your suitcases, everything like that they're going through, and we're trying to explain what things are. Let me tell you something, and, and, and it was funny because it, as you've traveled, and you know, there are some TSA agents that are more diligent about what they're doing than somebody else. Somebody else is like, I'm going through every piece, you know. And then there's others like, eh, go on through. You're fine. You know, well, the guy in that city, that yeah, was good. Just go on. I tell you what, security is important these days, but I want to tell you this. The security of your mind and what you allow into your mind is far more important than any security in an airport. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. We need to guard our hearts. We need to set a watch on the things that enter our mind, enter our heart. Psalm 25.5 that we've said, wait on the Lord all day. That is guarding what can come into our life through our eyes, through our ears, through our thoughts, our attitudes, our philosophies, our way of thinking, our opinions, our theology. We need to understand our spiritual weaknesses and know that's where Satan attacks overtly and covertly. Satan is not going to leave you alone or me alone. And that's why if I'm going to wait upon God all day long, I have to guard what comes into my mind. So, Again, does that mess up my schedule? No. Do I have to stop doing something in my schedule to wait on God all day long? Do I just stand, wait, okay, Pastor Steve, wait on the Lord all day long. Uh, no. You go about your schedule, your busy schedule, your work, your flying. Whatever you're doing, you go about it. But throughout the day, you say, I'm going to take with me today. I don't want my devotions just to be something I do in the morning. I don't want my children or future generations to think that Christianity is all wrapped up in some discipline that we do or just going to church. I want my kids, I want your kids to live out throughout the week and the day what they learn here. Amen? 
It does, th this, this is great, first thing on a Sunday morning, but this is not the Christian life alone. Don't leave church this morning and leave it all in here. So as I go on through my Christian life, this is what makes your devotions alive and your prayer time alive and not boring because what I learn, I'm going to take with me. Throughout the day, I'm going to keep a principle before me. Throughout the day, I'm going to remember who I belong to. Throughout the day, I'm going to guard my mind and my ears and my heart as to what I allow to get in. I want more security than the airport because Satan will do everything he can to bring me down. And that's why the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 11, and 12, put on the whole full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you'll be able to, to, re to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm, stand firm there having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to, to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because I want to guard and protect the thoughts that come into my mind. That's what the psalmist is talking about when he says, and I wait upon you all day long. It's just not a momentary type of thing. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day long. J.W. Jowett, who was a early, who was a preacher back in the early 1900s, wrote this about this verse. Listen to it. He said, this implies a way of living in which the soul keeps itself reverently posed towards the eternal with an alert readiness to know and to do the will of the Lord in the very next step. That's exactly it. Learn to not merely approach God for a visit even a passionate visit, but learn and learn deeply what it means to really wait upon the Lord. You want an exciting Christian life? You want your devotions to be more real? You want your prayer life to be greater? Take it with you wherever you go. Amen? Wait on the Lord all day. Take what you get here. Are you going to remember every single point from this? Probably not. But hopefully you got at least one point that the Holy Spirit gave you and that I'm taking with me all day long. I'm going to keep my thoughts upon him. I'm going to remember who I belong to. And I'm going to guard my mind. Okay. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you're with us. You are with us wherever we go. Lord, let us be with you wherever we go. Lord, I pray that we wait upon you all day. And we ask this in your name we pray. Amen.